So Spike Island was something that I had known about as a project for a couple of years, but I it wasn't it didn't originate with me. And most of the projects I work on is something that I thought of and then, then ended up developing into a film. So it was it was unusual. I was kind of director for hire in that sense. And I've loved the Stone Roses all my life. I didn't grow up on the music initially because I was slightly too young to have heard it the first time round. So as I was growing up in Oxford and listening to music and getting back into older albums, I discovered it that way. But um, it was Chris Cogill, the writer. He knew of the Stone Rose and then, you know, when he was growing up and then he became friends with Manny and he got together with Fiona Nielsen, the producer, and they were talking about how to do something set around that time. And the three of us met on 24 Hour Party People, Michael Winterbottom's film, about the Manchester music scene. So we kind of were all on each other's radar and then it wasn't until the last couple of years that they came to me talking about this project. For me, it wasn't exclusively about the music. I, in a way, the music was slightly off-putting, having worked on a lot of music videos and having worked on a film about Ian Jury. Actually, I kind of felt, do I really want to do another music film so soon after? And there was a project that was really close to my heart, which I'd written called Ashes, which I was trying to get made at the time. So I said, well, do you know what? I, I think I need to go off and make this film first. I, th I love the project, I love the script. But if I go off and do this, first of all, I'd, I'd be kind of letting myself down, not doing the film this film that I really want to do and also I feel like if you go from project to project and they're all too similar you end up getting pigeonholed but actually once we finished Ashes and I, I worked with Fiona on that then it was it was just a foregone conclusion I love the script and I just wanted to, to jump on board so it was a mixture actually in terms of experience of the kids in the film so there was it was very hard because I got together with Jane Ripley the casting director very early on in the process and we sat down and we were going well look it's a quite a dense uh, talky script. The banter is, is more akin to kind of Kevin Smith than Ken Loach. It's not naturalistic. It's more like how kids would like to speak rather than how they do speak, which is what I loved about it. It wasn't it wasn't just a straightforward kind of uh, fly on the wall type drama. But the problem is it's hard to get your, your tongue around that stuff, especially if you're young and relatively inexperienced. But I wanted to try and get a rawness to it and I wanted to try and find kids who you hadn't seen before. So initially we went and found kids who weren't interested in acting and they were terrible, so that didn't really work. And then we went round to different drama schools and met kids, and they were, they were pretty good. But it was different, we still hadn't really found our leads. And then I met up with Elliot Tittensaw, who I'd seen in Shameless, but since he was a kid, I mean, he started out on that when he was pretty much a baby. And then I, I met Nico Mirallegro, who plays Dodge, who's like, he's kind of second in command, he's the guitarist. And doing that, then suddenly I kind of felt, well, all right, these guys, they haven't done any film, they've just done TV but they've got a level of experience that will enable the other guys to feel comfortable, they can all take their lead, I know they'll feel professional on the set, they're not going to be scared when I stick a camera in their faces. And it actually worked out perfectly because then it felt like it was the right mixture of the people who are more experienced and less experienced and they all kind of worked well together. We cast really early on, even though the, the, like the finance wasn't completely secured, we didn't know when we were starting. But I just wanted to make sure they got a time to hang out and, and become mates. Now, Nico and Elliot did actually know each other already and that was really helpful in terms of just knowing that they were going to immediately feel like they'd known each other all their lives. Yeah. Once we cast them, then we kind of sent them off. They went off to Amsterdam for a few days, hung out, probably didn't even read the script, but just became like a group and became like all the banter suddenly became second nature. And then I got them together, and I don't tend to rehearse very much, but this time I just wanted to make sure they were totally on top of the script. So we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it, even when the script was changing. And then the other thing was we, none of them were natural musicians apart from Adam, who played a little bit of guitar. So even though everyone said they were amazing musicians in the auditions, actually we, we kind of knew that they weren't. So we sent them off to kind of music uh, boot camp, or for want of a better word, and uh, they were they, they were trained by musicians for a few weeks to the point where they could play the two main songs in the film, and then they got vis a visit by Manny at the end of that process just to kind of give him his blessing on the group, and then they they by the end of that process they'd really bonded and they became best friends. It's still kind of a period of film. Things start, and the further back you go, actually in a way I suppose if you're making a film set in the 18th century, if it was rural then it's easier than doing a, a film set 20 years ago over here. So I think suddenly you realise everything, even in central Manchester, has completely changed. So that was quite difficult, finding locations, getting the costumes right, and then also just getting the banter right between the kids, because I quite, I was favoured, you know, a bit of improvisation, let them kind of make the script their own. But unfortunately they're sticking all these kind of rude boy comments and, and things which really don't gel. So we had to kill a stamp on that quite hard. And just giving it a kind of period feel was... The, what was important to me was kind of let's have moments where we suddenly see all of Manchester or we suddenly see all of Spike Island through a mis mixture of kind of choosing clever, clever angles and using visual effects and then when you're close up and when you're in, in kind of smaller spaces and stuff you kind of you feel like you've now got leeway to go and, and, and be a bit tighter and, and you've kind of you've shown that we've established the period so it's not it's not an issue anymore. 
when you're working with kids this age that enthusiasm and energy is not a problem yeah. <laughs> it's just it's a, it's if anything it's the opposite yeah you need to get them to sit still for two minutes you know if you're doing a slow tracking shot in one of the characters faces halfway through they'll they'll get bored and start fidgeting and stare down the barrel of the lens so bottling their energy was it was just making sure that um, you know you feel that you're definitely kind of part of that group and so when I talked to Chris the cameraman and, and the DP he, he just said when he'd working on other dramas with uh, with kids it was just somehow just making sure that the camera has the same kind of swagger as the group so we definitely went for a lot of kind of handheld feel we wanted it to kind of engage with kids now rather than people who are just nostalgic for the time so I think in a way the characters like the sixth member of the gang it should constantly be kind of pushing in desperately trying to cry, you know get get your attention pull you in drag you in and and that's the energy the kids have that's the energy we wanted the film to have good question um, Ralph is a um, is a very um, private person so it took many years of of being with Ralph to even understand um, what the film was about and, and, and how we would uh, structure it so the first first five years was really just um, uh, spending time with Ralph and watching uh, what is repeated and what was familiar to Ralph and then from that we developed a a, a series of interests that then became things we shot for the edit process. We actually animated the, uh, Ralph doesn't animate, uh, there, 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 are, there are kind of, um, it's all about moving art, so because it's a film, uh, we, we, we were very um, intent on, on keeping the, the art alive and not having the camera pan over Ralph's art. So Ralph, um, Ralph always, for the last 10 years, has always had a digital camera above his drawing desk with a little remote button, and whenever he draws, he just leans up and takes a frame. So um, each month I'll go down to Ralph's and pick up a little digital chip uh, from him full of all his art building up. Uh, and these uh, became informative about what he was working on in that month. And of course it was a marvel for me to see this material. They're all high def beautiful high definition stills that we then started working around. And that was entirely shot by Ralph in his studio when he works. So it's almost like a time Absolutely. Absolutely, driven by Ralph, it was fantastic. Uh, then the process of animating was very different. Um, we animated some of Ralph's more iconic drawings, like the work from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Leonardo. Uh, with that process, we were very aware that Ralph's drawings are very two-dimensional. They are drawn in a, in a very flat plane. So we couldn't take our characters and walk them around uh, and, and create new scenes for them. We very much had to keep them within the boundaries that they were drawn in. So um, we managed to um, start animating his material. We'd show it to Ralph, see what he thought. At first we were overcomplicating it and trying to interpret stuff that didn't exist. And we soon got the hang with Ralph as to how it worked. And then one day Ralph, um, Ralph said to me, um, that he thinks his work is like the moment a fly hits the windscreen of a car and splatters on the car, traveling at 90 miles an hour in the other direction. And that's the moment his art is. It's very two-dimensional, it's full of energy, and obviously full of um, questions about what's actually happened. Um, so we decided, in fact, to, to animate that fly's journey up until that moment. And the moment it hits that windscreen is where you're left as a viewer at the art. And that started to work really well. We, we realized that we had captured Ralph's art, but also created it uh, in a way that was friendly for film. We would, to be perfectly honest, the people that appeared in the film are all very close friends or acquaintances of Ralph. Uh, I came across them purely by hanging out in Ralph's studio. And either they would drop in or they would uh, have pictures on the wall uh, that, that I, I would ask Ralph who's that by and he'd say it's by Terry Gilliam and, and I would track him down and ask him why and so on. So all the, all the people that are actually in the film are all uh, people that are, are close friends of Ralph's or people that uh, are indebted to Ralph, to be perfectly honest. Um, Terry Gilliam um, gave us a lovely interview where uh, he explained that Ralph was one of his first influences and that's why he has a picture on the wall saying to Ralph, I owe you more than you'll ever know. Uh, and we interviewed that. To be perfectly honest, um, we had a lot of interviews um, with lots of people that we couldn't all not fit into the film, but the film was driven by Ralph and his work. So, um, so and we didn't want to have a lot of people just telling us how they love Ralph. Uh, it wasn't very helpful for the message. So, um, so sadly, some people didn't make it into the film who I really wish had, um, like Bruce Robinson, had a fantastic interview with him. Uh, which will, All these people will make the DVD, but... Um, but for the film, the narrative of the film, we, we couldn't include them. Tim Robbins came down, flew over from America and came down and spent time at Ralph's studio, uh, which again, we just couldn't shoehorn him into this precious hour and a half that you get to make a movie in. 
and um, and Will Self and numerous other people. So we had a fantastic cast of participants, of which the cream of those interviews and um, people uh, made it through to the uh, final cut. I mean, for me, um, one of the beauties of the film is seeing it in the cinema. We created it um, to to be. Um, to be projected and to be heard in a in a theatrical space, uh, because his art um, is just incredibly beautiful, incredibly uh, detailed, nothing else. And to see art uh, firsthand in such a, a high, in a pristine way, uh, is such a beautiful thing. Uh, and these things often get. Um, um, kind of like squashed down to TV with cups of tea going off and people talking to other people that um, the focus is lovely in the cinema and also we have a fantastic soundtrack which um, which was important to have in Dolby Stereo. Um, the music's contemporary we wanted to make sure that the music spoke to our audience uh, and our audience for this film is a young audience it's not the film is not for people who already know about Ralph uh, they can buy his books and they know about him this is this is a film to take Ralph's message to a much younger audience and and open it up to to 18 to 25 30 year olds so the music is a contemporary music track with with people who hopefully will draw um, them to the the cinema uh, also they're all people again who love and work with Ralph so the inclusion of the track Gonzo from the All-American Rejects was because they wrote the track with Ralph in mind and um, same with Slash and same with um, um, Jason Mraz and all these artists actually um, took um, we actually delivered um, the cut as it stood to them and they, they chose the section they wanted to work on and they created music for that section. So in the same way that Ralph is the artist um, in picture, uh, they are the artists in audio. And um, Absolutely. How they feel about Ralph, which is a marvellous thing. So, so that's why I feel some, a lot of the music um, is really meant and sits in a good place for me.